What's up, everybody? Time for more tricky parts of calculus. In the last episode, I introduced the hyperbolic trig functions cosh and cinch in the most natural way, but a way that's almost never taught, as functions parameterizing the unit hyperbola by areas of hyperbolic sectors and derive their expressions in terms of exponential functions. In this episode, I want to talk about the famous catenary problem, or the problem of finding the shape of a hanging chain, since, spoiler alert, the solution is a hyperbolic cosine. There are many expositions of the solution of the catenary, including here on YouTube, but this one is going to be the best because I'm gonna highlight some features of the original historical solution with special attention to some tricky integrals that come up. In fact, I'm gonna cover about half of the standard second semester of calculus through this one example. So before I get into some hardcore math, let me give a bit of history. The shape of a hanging chain is one of the oldest problems in calculus or differential equations because it's one of those questions that was staring people in the face since catenaries are all around us. Actually, there's a more urgent form of this problem. What shape ought we to build a stable arch? The equation for the arch is the same, just inverted. Work on the problem goes back at least to Leonardo da Vinci, but brilliant as he was, he didn't have calculus or Newton's laws. For the early scientists and mathematicians who considered the catenary problem, people like Steven, Beekman, and Galileo, the challenge appeared to be to find a proof that the shape was a parabola. The parabola was a very familiar curve, and it certainly looked close enough to the shape of actual chains. Galileo argued in the 1630s that the shape must be a parabola by analogy with the trajectory of a projectile, but that reasoning is just incorrect, and the catenary is not actually a parabola. Here's an experiment that shows the catenary is not a parabola. I wonder if anyone in the 17th century ever did this. Take an actual hanging chain and take the appropriate measurements, maybe by projecting the chain onto some graph paper, so you can fit a parabola to it. There are several ways you could do this, but it doesn't matter too much what we mean by the best fit. For simplicity, just take the parabola with vertex at the bottom of the chain that also passes through the endpoints of the chain. If you do this, you'll likely find that the difference is really small small enough perhaps to be within the margin of error of a physical demonstration. But if you then take a much longer chain made of the same stuff and suspend it from two taller poles spaced farther away and adjust the length between the fixed points and the height of the fixed points so that it exactly covers the original chain in the middle and is therefore an extension of the same catenary, you will see that it rises much more steeply than the parabola. This is a strong indication that the catenary is not a parabola. Now, not everyone agrees about who deserves credit for first showing that the catenary is not a parabola, but I think the honor goes to Christian Huygens. Here is one of his diagrams from a letter to Mersenne from 1646 when he was only 17 years old. He imagined a kind of discretization of the problem where the catenary consisted of straight lines holding up a sequence of weights. Assuming equal weights, the extended segments intersect along the vertical bisectors of the segments, a property he showed was incompatible with a parabola. Huygens is not as well known today as the other progenitors of calculus, in part, I think, because he solved such difficult problems in calculus so far in advance of the modern formalism that his work is harder to learn. You have to really know calculus to convert Huygens' arguments into the arguments we're used to, but it can be done. I'm not gonna go any farther explaining Huygens' actual methods, but I want to give him the credit since he essentially derived the differential equation for the catenary. The full solution of the catenary problem is dated to 1691. In 1690, three years after the publication of Newton's Principia, Jacob Bernoulli proposed that a prize be offered for the determination of the true shape of the catenary. And within a year, solutions were offered independently by Johann Bernoulli, Jacob's younger brother by 12 years, Leibniz, and a now much older Huygens, and they were all published together. So that places the solution here on this silly timeline of the first important differential equations to be solved. I say silly because, of course, every single aspect of this timeline is open to debate, dates, attributions. Am I missing something important? That's what comments are for. I just wanted to point these things out. Each of their solutions was by a different method that illustrated some particular aspect of the catenary. I'm gonna focus first on Johann Bernoulli's solution, which draws out the connection between the catenary, the hyperbola, and the arc length along a parabola. 
What was common to all the solutions was the derivation of an equation or model of the catenary. I'm going to use the Newtonian formalism that was available at the time. There's another model based on minimizing an energy using the Euler-Lagrange formalism that came quite a bit later. The key assumption of the catenary is for any section of the chain, the only forces are the force due to gravity and the tension along the chain, which keeps it together. The internal tensions cancel, and so only the tension forces at the ends act to counter the force of gravity. This is true for any segment of the chain, so it turns out to be extremely convenient to take one of the endpoints of the segment to be the lowest point, where the tension is directed horizontally. Then for any other point on the chain, the tension directed tangent to that point cancels the horizontal tension and the vertical force due to gravity. The gravitational force or the weight is lambda gs, where lambda is the linear density of the chain, g is the acceleration due to gravity, and s is the length of the segment. We can divide the vertical component equation by the horizontal and get that dy dx or the slope is equal to the weight of the chain divided by the horizontal tension at the lowest point. Usually, T naught over lambda G is abbreviated as a constant A. So you get the equation dy dx equals S over A. In other words, the catenary is a curve that rises from its lowest point in such a way that its derivative is everywhere proportional to the arc length along itself back to the lowest point. The problem is fundamentally about arc length, and that's what makes it hard. This is not exactly a standard differential equation in this form. The arc length s is given by the integral of square root 1 plus dy dx squared along the segment. If we wanted a proper differential equation, we'd have to differentiate and use the fundamental theorem of calculus to get y double prime equals 1 over a square root of 1 plus y prime squared, which we can convert into a first order equation by taking u equals y prime to get u prime equals 1 over a square root of 1 plus u squared. So which function's derivative is a constant times the root of one plus its value squared? Not a linear function in any case, which means the catenary is not a parabola. Now, it is possible to solve this equation if you can integrate du over square root of one plus u squared. It's not a trivial integral, though it is elementary, and there are several ways to solve it. Of course, it's easy if you have a nice table of integrals somewhere or Wolfram alpha, but there was no such thing in the 17th century. How could you do it from scratch? So here's Johann Bernoulli's solution, which shows a connection between the catenary hyperbola and parabola that I don't think many people have seen. Bernoulli actually gave a construction of the catenary without explicitly giving a formula, though it's possible to derive the formula from his construction. Here's Bernoulli's diagram, so you can marvel at it before I explain how he derived it. Let's fix A equals one for our catenary for simplicity. Bernoulli takes the parabola with equation Y equals X squared over eight plus one, y the coefficient one eighth in a moment. Then he draws the top half of the unit hyperbola y squared minus x squared equals one. Note that eventually the parabola will surpass the hyperbola, but that's not shown here. And now here's the incredible construction. For any fixed height, if you take the arc length of the parabola from the vertex up to that height, then if that same length is extended horizontally along the line at height y from the right side of the hyperbola, then the left endpoints of that segment at each height lie on the catenary with A equals one. How about that? You're not wrong to wonder, how did he come up with this? In his paper, Bernoulli just stated the facts of this construction. It was part of the style of the time not to give a full proof, perhaps so you would look like more of a genius or something. That's not the style today, fortunately, but this is how he did it. First of all, Bernoulli's way of attacking the equation dy dx equals s was to eliminate s or write s in terms of x and y. It's not easy in this form, but if you flip the graph and look at dx dy, a very common method at the time and something we'll see several times in this video, we have the equation of the curve dx dy equals one over s, but also the arc length relation ds equals square root of one plus dx dy squared dy equals square root of one plus s squared over s times dy. And this equation is easy to integrate. You get that y equals square root of one plus s squared or s equals square root of y squared minus one. Note that this implies a new characterization of the catenary with a equals one, that at each height, the arc length is the same as the distance from the y axis to the unit hyperbola at that height. That's also something that Bernoulli stated in his paper 
which I learned by plugging in a lot of Latin into Google Translate. It also means that dx dy equals one over square root of y squared minus one, so we get a new integral expression for x. And that happened to be an integral expression Bernoulli had seen before in connection with another famous problem of finding the arc length of a parabola, which he knew to have been solved. The arc length of Bernoulli's parabola can be written as the integral of square root of one plus x squared over 16. But if you view the curve the other way, considering x as a function of y, you end up with the integral from one to y naught of y plus one over square root of y squared minus one. It's from these nice coefficients that he derived the proper coefficient of one eighth. You split this into two integrals, one of which is what we just said is the x coordinate of the catenary with a equals one. The other has a very simple substitution and evaluates to square root of y naught squared minus one, which is the x coordinate at height y naught on the unit hyperbola. That's how Bernoulli constructed the solution of the catenary problem. It's a bit strange to us today, maybe, that he didn't write down an explicit formula for the solution. To Bernoulli, it sufficed to give this description together with the conclusion that the function of the catenary, whatever it was, could not possibly be a narrower parabola or a hyperbola because he could say that the curve was not algebraic, that is not given by any formula involving rational functions and radicals. And that's because it came from the subtraction of an algebraic function from the arc length of a parabola or the area under hyperbola, which was known not to be algebraic. Today, we'd say the logarithm is not an algebraic function. This is a fact we don't dwell on in a calculus class today, and it's not obvious how to prove it, but it was considered important in the early days of the logarithm. I think I'll prove that the log is not algebraic in another video. If you want an explicit formula for the catenary, you have to be able to compute these integrals. I'm gonna show several ways to do it. Let's go back to the first version of the integral, the integral of du over square root one plus u squared, which equals x over a. With hindsight, you can see that this integral defines an inverse hyperbolic sign, substitute u equals sinh t, and the identities from the previous episode work to trivialize the integral. So u equals sinh x over a, the constant of integration is zero since we're choosing coordinates where the lowest point of the chain is at x equals zero, and u is equal to y prime, so we get the solution y equals a cosh x over a plus c, the equation of the catenary. Now, given the work of the previous episode on hyperbolic functions, there's nothing circular about this, but these functions were only introduced 70 years after the catenary was solved, so I'm going to look for other methods that could have been worked out by the original solvers. So here's another way to deal with the integral of du over square root one plus u squared. A substitution that might at first seem to come out of the blue is to let v equals u plus square root one plus u squared. I'm gonna give an explanation as to how this change of variables could suggest itself soon, but for right now, observe that dv equals one plus u over square root of one plus u squared du, which is equal to v over square root of one plus u squared du, or du over square root one plus u squared equals dv over v. So the integral comes to log v equals log u plus square root one plus u squared, and it's just a matter of some algebraic manipulation to write u as a function of x in terms of exponentials. If you've defined hyperbolic functions, you recognize this as a cinch function. Now, I'll point out that the integral we're interested in is the same as an integral we've already seen in episode six. Under the substitution u equals tan theta, the integral becomes the integral of the secant first studied by Edward Wright in the late 1500s in connection with the problem of meridional parts or how to compute the change in longitude when traveling at a fixed heading and computed by James Gregory in 1668. It seems very likely that Gregory played with various substitutions and rewritings of the integrand until he noticed that if you multiply by secant plus tangent over secant plus tangent, the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. So the integral is the log of secant plus tangent Note that this is really based on the same idea as the previous technique since the secant equals square root of one plus u squared. So here's the method, which in essence was historically first and I think is the most natural. 
Let's compute the arc length of a parabola, sometimes called the rectification of the parabola. This was another famous problem of the 17th century. Descartes made a declaration in the 1640s to the effect that finding an expression for the arc length of a parabola was beyond the capacities of man. A rather similar kind of declaration to the one I discussed in episode three of this series made by Aristotle about the arc length of a circle and similarly proven wrong in a short span of time since Huygens worked out the arc length of a parabola in 1659. His observation was the arc length of a parabola is just the area under a certain hyperbola and the area under the standard hyperbola y equals one over x was worked out to be related to Napier's logarithm by St. Vincent in 1647, as I described in episodes five and six. The difference between a hyperbola like y squared minus x squared over 16 equals one and y equals one over x would not have been daunting to mathematicians of the time. Again, it's just a matter of turning your head with a simple change of variables. We can break up this transformed region into simple triangular pieces and a piece we recognize as the logarithm. And after a whole lot of algebra, the expression for the area is two times log of x over four plus square root of one plus x squared over 16 plus x over four times square root of one plus x squared over 16. To recover the expression for the catenary, remember the geometric setup we should write the parabolic arc length in terms of the height y. After more algebra, we get that the length is log of y plus square root y squared minus one plus the square root of y squared minus one. For y as a function of x, we invert like we did before, and you find that y equals e to the x plus e to the minus x all over two, or cosh of x. The square root y squared minus one term is just the x coordinate at height y on the hyperbola y squared minus x squared equals one. The log term gives the x coordinate on the catenary at height y. This is how combining the insights of Huygens and Johann Bernoulli, they could have arrived at an expression for the catenary. That is, except that the exponential function was not really in use at the time. More about that when I come to Leibniz's solution. And notice that the same tangent substitution converts the integral in the rectification of a parabola into the integral of the secant cubed, which is not hard to compute if you have the integral of secant, it's just an extra integration by parts. But as I mentioned, Huygens worked this out nine years before Gregory computed the integral of the secant. Coming back to explain the substitution in the second method, it's actually a similar idea as in this method of changing our view to the standard hyperbola, only in that case, it was not obviously about finding areas of regions, but lurking in the background were two curves, both hyperbolas that could be linearly transformed into each other, and we were computing rational differentials on these curves. The ordinate v equals u plus y was a natural coordinate on the curve vw equals one. And I'll talk about one more method, adopting a perspective that wasn't around in the 17th century. In fact, for every integral where the integrand is a rational function of u and y, where u and y satisfy a quadratic polynomial, so they lie on a conic section, there exists a rational parameterization of the curve, which converts the integral into the integral of a rational function. And integrals of rational functions can always be integrated in principle by the method of partial fractions to result in rational functions plus logarithms plus arctangents. In our case, we're interested in the conic y squared minus u squared equals one, and projecting through zero one with lines of slope t gives the parameterization uy equals two t over one minus t squared, comma one plus t squared over one minus t squared with the absolute value of t less than one for the top half of the hyperbola. With some algebra and partial fractions, the integral comes to log of one plus t over one minus t, and with more algebra, you can recover the exponential expression for u on the catenary. So those are five different methods. Note that the crucial piece common to all of these methods is the relation of areas under hyperbola to the logarithm. Without that, you couldn't get an expression for the catenary or the arc length of a parabola. So finally, I want to briefly mention Leibniz's very different solution to the catenary problem. Leibniz did offer a functional expression for the catenary in terms of exponentials. Here you can see the actual diagram from his paper involving a construction of both the catenary and the exponential curve. You can see that Leibniz called what we call the exponential curve a logarithmic curve, another instance of the view that the inverse was just the same function merely flipped. 
Leibniz's paper describes the construction of this curve, which I don't want to get into. And just like Bernoulli's paper doesn't reveal the proof that the exponential and the catenary are related. So it's a matter of speculation how Leibniz actually figured this out. But I think the following is a pretty good guess. Start with the defining equation and differentiate to get the differential equation y double prime equals one over a square root of one plus y prime squared. Then square both sides and let u equal y prime. So u prime squared equals one over a squared times one plus u squared. Now differentiate again to get the equation two u prime u double prime equals one over a squared two u prime u or u double prime equals one over a squared u. Note that squaring and differentiating could introduce extraneous solutions, but now we have a much simpler linear differential equation. This equation Leibniz could solve by the method of power series. Let u be the sum c sub n x to the n. The equation says n plus two n plus one c sub n plus two equals one over a squared c sub n. So you get separate equations for even and odd coefficients in terms of c0 and c1, which are arbitrary. That means you can get two independent solutions, one even and one odd. The initial conditions show that the correct combination for the catenary is the odd solution. And Leibniz knew this was the odd part of the inverse of the logarithm at x over a, or the exponential function. His letters to Newton show they knew the exponential series in 1676. It's worth noting that in the second part of his paper on the catenary, Leibniz computed the base of the natural logarithm, what we today call E, correctly to 12 decimal places using the first several terms of the exponential power series evaluated at one, exactly as I described in episode five of this series. In conclusion, hanging chains make hyperbolic cosines. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful. I discovered to my astonishment during the making of this video that neither Stewart's nor Spivak's calculus texts contain an exposition of the catenary problem, although it is in the book by Thomas and Finney. Thanks so much for watching. Check out the other videos in this series for more of the hard stuff that's not covered in a calculus class.